way to get things up to the cross trees. Will we see whales today? You'll have to ask Dr. Abrams that. Is that Ann? She said I could call her that. Interior decorating Ramon. I thought it wouldn't hurt to see what we're looking for. That's nice. Okay, all hands on deck. All hands on deck. Let's get these sails up, get underway. You and Rebecca get the staysail halyard. It's Rachel. Staysail? Halyard? Come on. What do you want us, Captain? You and Miss Abrams get the stops off the mizzen. Take it right up. Ready? There he goes. <laughs> no, Arthur, Arthur, that's wrong. <laughs> it's this one. Let's go on that station. Stay out of the way. Raquel, get that lacing line off the main. It's Rachel! It's cleated, Arthur. We did. Belay that line on the double, Arthur. Let's move. Rachel! It's right. You stand by forward of the mainmast. Keep an eye on those peril beads. Make sure they don't get fouled. Okay, take her up. I do it fast. So your parents have their own boat? They don't have anything. They're separated. My father has an ocean racer. I crew for him. Like this one? <laughs> Are you kidding? Arthur, a racing sloop is like a Ferrari. This thing is a truck. Hey, How can you go to college? It's the college for the deaf. Everybody there is deaf? Just about. What's so funny? What? <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> it taught you really up to peanut butter. <laughs> 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 can you read that? 
<laughs> Should I sign? Oh, no. I can't even read that. All right. In the next month, we'll gather information in this area about humpback whales and about the ocean. Now, we'll study the whale's behavior, we'll count them, identify them, and we'll measure the ocean temperatures, and we'll study the bottom profile. That's all? Today, with any luck, you'll see your first whales. The humpbacks are returning from the winter mating grounds in the Caribbean, and they've eaten nothing for almost four months. They're running on empty. Hungry. <laughs> They concentrate where the food is up here in the shallow areas called banks. We'll be spending most of our time on George's bank, but today we'll be here on Stell Wagon Bank, and we should see whales. In June. You're right. We're getting close. Be careful up there. Now, the way you recognize a humpback whale is by these long white flippers, the bumpy head and chin, the small dorsal fin, and the black and white pattern on the underside or the ventral side of the flukes. Now, these fluke patterns are key. If we couldn't identify individual whales, we couldn't learn about where they go or how fast they travel or about mating behavior or anything. But we're lucky with the humpbacks. Their fluke patterns are as good as fingerprints, different for every whale. You really mean we can tell one whale from another? Sure. You probably learn to recognize a few by sight. When we get good photographs of the flukes, we compare them to the ones in this book. It's like a catalog of humpbacks. So they each have an ID number? Yep. And some of them have been given names. Like, for example, 0036 is known as Salt. Sally Rule says there's whales two miles ahead! Wait a sec, they're still two miles off, and we have a few more things to discuss. On the other hand, we could do it up on deck. observations and time as you call them out. Right. Now, Ramon's going to be taking pictures from the deck and Sally Ruth from the masthead. They'll be calling out to you, too. What if I get behind? We'll throw you overboard. Look, it's easy to get distracted once we are on whales. They're exciting and fun, and we can forget that we're here to make scientific observations. Look, I see one! Over there! Right, CT. That's a blow. Did you see it, Arthur? About 300 yards off the port bow. It's gone. Where'd it go? It don't, CT. How long can it stay under? Five, ten minutes, even more sometimes. And they breach first at 1523. Breaching off the starboard bow. Hey, why, why do they do that? We don't know for sure, but we've seen them do it 50 times or more in one bounce. Oh man, will you hey, it bad? Look, you see that? Breaching over there. Wow. Wow. Holy Listen to the noise they make of their flutes. 
We don't know why they do that either. Are they mad at us? It's possible. Well, we've seen them do that from a long way off, so it isn't necessarily because of us. Got it. Do you recognize that one? I think so. We'll know for sure when the film's about. Ramon? Hey, Sally Ruth developed the pictures already. I did recognize it. Fantastic. Why don't we see if they can find it in the book? Oh, good idea. Here's a clear shot, you guys. You can use some practice in matching fluke patterns. First one to match this fluke with the right one in the catalog gets, uh... Gets out of doing the dishes for a week? It's a deal. A week? A week? Sally. Wait, wait. See, T, you move your elbow. It's not me. Come on, wait. Rachel, don't hog the book. I'm not hogging the book. Hey, maybe it's this one. Number 1892. No, it's not. Look how dark now that is. Now look at it. Look how dark. That's not it. Oh, look. Look. How about that? It's no good. Nice try, though. But no cigar. No, that's not it. These are much too dark. No, I think we should go further back. Have you ever heard of starting at the beginning? Look, wait. This one's it. Boy, this is really hard. We'll never find it. There are a thousand of these things. This is impossible. They all look alike. No, they don't. Hey, look at this. Nah, this is a waste of time. Wait a minute. No, it isn't. It's number 0159. Look. Yeah, OK. What's that? It's a program we're working on to help us identify flukes. Steve. We divide the flukes into 14 sectors. And then we tell the computer the coloring, which means whether it's black or white, and any markings on each sector. We choose from this list. These are all the coloring and marking possibilities. So the computer already has this information for each fluke in the catalog? Right. And it just quickly compares the black and white patterns, and the markings from all the sectors, and then it gives us a list of the most likely choices. We still have to make the final choice by eye. Now here's the computer's list for the same wheel you've been trying to identify. It is? Look, I told you number 0159 is in there. Yeah, he's right. Vintage 0159. Yeah, that was French. She's an old friend. We've seen her three years in a row. I don't believe it. Yeah, I don't even know what this is for a week. Ow! Get out of here, you lucky little guy. Man, I can't wait till tomorrow. Think we'll see whales again? You'll never know. Hi, my name is Mark Graham, and not Arthur Spencer. Arthur Spencer is just a character in Voyage of the Mimi. I enjoyed playing him because I got to travel around, meet people, and especially see whales, which brings me here, to Provincetown, Massachusetts. <laughs> Five months ago, while we were filming The Voyage of the Mimi, I got to know two whale scientists here who were sort of real-life models for the characters of Anne and Ramon. I came back to learn more about their work with humpbacks and maybe also learn a little about some of the other kinds of whales there are. Carol Carlson is a marine biologist who specializes in identifying individual humpbacks. 
Is that Stormy? Yeah, and Stormy yeah. Mayo is also Stormy. a marine hey. biologist who started the Provincetown Center for Coastal Studies, where they both work. He grew up in Provincetown and first learned about whales from his father, a fisherman. What are you doing here? I understand you've got to come down and uh, give us a hand. Sure. Yeah, sure. I hope, I hope uh, you're ready for that. Yeah. You're all ready. ready for work. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I thought I'd take him on an aerial survey this afternoon if there's room in the plane. What do you think about that? On a plane? On a plane. Really? Yeah, that's how we do part of our work. Yeah, and you might see a lot of whales, too. From the sky? Of... Yeah. <laughs> a whole great. new perspective of whale research. <laughs> but yeah. it isn't all fun, because <laughs> after that, you've got to come in and give me a hand in the lab. Sure, I'll be glad uh, to. We got a Carol lot and now. Stormy usually work from a boat, but an airplane lets them see Hi, a big area all at once. Hi. Bob, this is Mark Graham. This Hi, is Mark. Bob Walsh, pilot. Nice to meet you. Welcome aboard. Step right in. Here we go. It was late November. Each fall, the humpbacks leave the northern feeding ground and spend the winter in the warm waters of the Caribbean, where they mate and have their babies. Carol thought they had left by this time last year, but she had sighted lots of whales the week before. So she was anxious to find out if the migration had begun. So was I. But I don't know if I was more excited about the possibility of seeing whales again or by going up in an airplane. It was only my second time. What we're basically doing, Mark, is trying to get as many observers as possible to look for a spout or a splash of water or the back of a whale, anything that would indicate the presence of a whale. Right now, we're flying. We flew very all over Stowe Wagon Bank. It was great fun but there sure weren't any whales. It looked to me like the humpbacks must have left. Then Carol saw something in the distance. We've got a spout off the port side. It's out at about seven o'clock. The whale's still on the surface. It looks like one individual. I had to take her word for it. All I saw was waves. She noted the position of the sighting for her records. We it so that we can pinpoint the location of the whale. We kept on looking. But after an hour without another sighting, we turned for home. For Carol, seeing only one humpback was as important as seeing a lot. And what that may mean, since now we're in Cape Cod Bay and haven't seen much of anything, is that the humpbacks may have gone. So we learned something. When the humpbacks started their long migration this year. That's pretty amazing. Something told them that it was time to go. And in a week, it looked like most of them were out of there. Someday, scientists may figure out why they leave when they do. Anyhow, I learned something else. I could survive an hour winging over the ocean and still keep my lunch down. I have to admit, it was touch and go there for a while. Yep. One reason scientists like Carol study whales is to help save them. Humpbacks were once hunted so much that they're now in danger of becoming extinct. The more we know about them, the better we can help them. What do you think? It's a nice plane. As we walk we back to the center, Carol talked about the importance of their work. And whales represent part of a very fragile environment. It's a very critical one for not only the whales, but for us. We get so much from the ocean. Mm. Not only the beauty from just looking out at it, but it's a, a, an abundant food source. Personally, if I, I've always been drawn to the ocean. No matter where I've lived, I've always wanted to, to go to the ocean, have been drawn to it. And the whales. But Carol can't always be out on the ocean observing. When the weather turns bad and winter comes, there's always other work to be done. Because we're in the lab now, we don't have so many good offshore days, and we're trying to figure out exactly who we saw offshore. Some of the same humpbacks, probably, that you saw in the Mimi. And also Back at the lab, Stormy was working on some of those summer observations, charting all the whales they had sighted, and I gave him a hand. For each whale, we listed the time, date, location, and its behavior. A lot like the work we did on the Mimi. Next, we're going to take Spoon. Um, April 19, April 20, 27 April, 3 May. This work isn't the most fun for the scientists, May, but they have to do it to get a general picture of the whale's movements. You may. We worked two solid hours before we had a break. But anyway, thank you for that. and. Uh, We'll get the other 118 from you, and uh, we'll complete it. <laughs> I learned a lot from uh, the Mimi about uh, humpbacks, but uh, the other was I don't know much about. 
There are two uh, main groups of whales, of course, you know that. Uh, the, uh, the two cetaceans uh -huh. and the baleen whales. Yeah. You wouldn't and, believe uh, how many different kinds of whales there are. Big ones, whales. small ones, fat ones, thin ones. Stormy explained to me that one way scientists group whales is by whether they have teeth. Some whales have teeth and some don't. And this familiar whale with the giant squid on his face is the biggest one with teeth, sperm whales. They eat giant squid and they dive deeper than most submarines can to do it. They can hold their breath up to one hour or more. Sperms grow to 60 feet, about as long as the Mimi and they have the biggest brains on Earth. 20 pounds of brains. What can they be thinking? Dolphins and porpoises are toothed whales. That's right, whales. Stomy says dolphins are technically whales. As you can see, they don't look much like the big humpbacks behind them. Most dolphins seem friendly. They've even been known to help save people who were drowning. They're practically everywhere in all the oceans over 60 different kinds, and lots of shapes and sizes, from five-footers to the biggest dolphin of them all, the orca, or killer whale. Orcas grow to 30 feet, and boy, do they have teeth. They'll eat almost anything, fish, birds, even other whales. But they're really not any more vicious than any animal that hunts, and they've never been known to attack a human. I'm still not sure that I'd swim with one, the way they do in aquarium shows. The different shapes of their six-foot dorsal fins help scientists identify individual orcas. They're found in every ocean, and they're not in danger of extinction. One of the weirdest toothed whales is my favorite, the narwhal. The male has a six to nine-foot tusk sticking out of his upper lip. Believe it or not, it's really his left front tooth. It makes it look like a unicorn to me. But nobody knows what it's for. People used to think the tusk had magical powers and hunted the narwhal for it. The last toothed whale Stormy told me about was the all-white beluga whale from the North Pole. Sailors used to call them sea canaries because of the noises they make. Sometimes they come into shallow waters to rub themselves clean on the bottom. Scientists don't really know if belugas are endangered. I hope not. Uh, so it's lots of different feeding mechanisms. You can see there are all these different shapes of whales. Stormy told me next and about the whales without teeth. They've evolved to eat tiny fish and shrimp like things called krill. Huge <laughs> quantities of stuff, yeah. right? Uh, and, they, uh, and they have to have a filtration mechanism because that, those huge quantities are made up of real small animals and they'd lose them right out through their mouths. Mm. It wouldn't really be very... It would be pretty tough to bite something that small. So these whales eat by taking a big mouthful of water with thousands of little fish in it. Then they push the water back out through this kind of curtain that hangs from their upper gum. Stormy showed me a piece of it. So as the whale squeezes the water out uh, from the inside to the out, the, uh, the water squeezed through this net mm -hmm. and all the small fish and whatever are trapped on this hairy material. This is the curtain-like strainer is called baleen and the whales that have it are called baleen whales. Stormy told me about some of them too. That, that big dark one up there, the right whale, is, uh, is uh, in the North Atlantic. Uh, some one of the strangest looking baleen whales is the right whale. All right whales have growths on their heads, called callosities. No one knows if they serve any purpose for the whale, but they help scientists tell one right whale from the other. Right whales got their name from old-time whale hunters. They thought it was the right whale to hunt because it was so slow and easy to harpoon. It also produced a lot of oil. Too bad, they were so right they were almost wiped out. Scientists think there may be too few left for the population to recover. One baleen whale that is recovering from near extinction is the gray whale. Whale hunters thought grays were the most ferocious of all whales. A lot of times they attacked the whaling boats after they were hit by a harpoon. 
They're friendly enough when no one's shooting at them. Each year, gray whales make the longest migration of any mammal, over 4,000 miles from the coast of Mexico to the bays of Alaska. The biggest baleen whale is the blue whale. It's not only the biggest of all the whales, it's the biggest animal ever to live on Earth, much larger even than the dinosaurs. The largest blue whales are the females. They're up to 100 feet long and weigh as much as 30 elephants, 180 tons. The heart of a whale that big is the size of a small car. My baby brother could crawl through its arteries. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of blue whales were killed by whalers. Now there are so few left, it's just possible a blue whale could wander the seas for years without ever seeing another one of its kind. The, 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 the I think I could have gone on all day listening to Stormy, but I had to go. And he and Carol won't stay in the lab long on a nice day. They wanted to check Stellwagen Bank to see if they could find the whale Carol spotted from the plane. So they headed for their research boat the Halos. Good boat, huh? Yeah. This is my father. Uh, he's the captain of the Halos. Hey, Charlie Mayo. Nice to meet you. Coming yeah. out with us? Oh, I'd love to, but I can't. I got to go home and do oh, home. I thought you were coming Good out. Day. Oh, you guys will be out all day. I got to get home. Well, School we got to get underway, but I certainly thank you for all the help you've been. I enjoyed and, uh, it. <laughs> yeah. Glad to I have couldn't you help here. thinking how Carol and Stormy had found a great way to make a living. There's still so little known about whales, but every time they go out, they could come back with new discoveries. Yeah,